Hello, everyone. Uh, so as you might have picked up, uh, one of my methods is I jump straight into the most controversial issues because I think they're often the most interesting. So for the first module, we're looking at the umbrella movement, which of course ties into education because it drew out so many students. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's considered a student movement, right? Um, so we're going to be looking at contentious politics. And we're going to be looking at through the framework of Charles Tilley. Um, so if we were in class, we'd kind of have this discussion of what name should it have even been called? Was it Occupy Central, Occupy Hong Kong, Umbrella Movement, or Umbrella Movement Revolution? There's even different Cantonese terms for it. I find it very interesting. Um, I personally don't think we should call it Occupy Central because Occupy Central is it's, a, it's too tied to Bing Tai and the Occupy Central with Love and Peace group. Um, I was at Civic Square, I was at the class boycott, they, they weren't there. Um, they were actually kind of opposed to what happened afterwards. Um, Occupy Hong Kong, that was a hashtag on, on Twitter. I think it's more representative of what happened. Um, personally, I just call it Occupy. Um, there was a debate between, is it the Umbrella Movement or is it the Umbrella Revolution? Um, I'm going to argue here that it fit social movements very well. So umbrella movement's probably the best term. Some people still insist that it was an umbrella revolution. Uh, there's debates on what constitutes a revolution, what is and what isn't a revolution. Um, I, I have actually made arguments also that maybe it was a revolution and the, that they wanted a revolution in, in consciousness, how people were thinking about politics in Hong Kong. Um, at that, they, they might have been successful, though it went in ways they might not have expected. So because this is a class talking about philosophy, um, you know, to, to, to look at this issue like a philosopher, you would ask questions like, where does power come from? What is democracy? How is it different from other forms of government? And what do leaders owe their people? And what do people owe their leaders? Um, some people might beg the question of, is this the end of history? Now, the end of history was an idea by Francis Fukuyama that he wrote at the end of the Cold War when he said, you know what, we've tried communism, we've tried socialism, um, it, it doesn't work. And what does work is liberal democracies. And what he meant by liberal democracies, the liberal there meant uh, liberal economies, right? So free trade, um, liberal also, you know, civic rights and political rights, which led to democracies. He was basically arguing every country is moving in the same direction, just different speeds. Um, this, of course, has been, it, it, it's a very controversial idea, of course. Um, what I'm <clears throat> going to be using for this class is Charles Tilly's framework of regimes and repertoires. Tilly is a very interesting political scientist, and I've been reading a lot of him recently. Um, he died in 2008. Um, he did very large-scale historical analysis of politics. Um, so I forget the name of the book title off the top of my head, but it was he has a book, Social Movements, um, I think it's like uh, 1650 to 1960. Um, he has another book called, uh, you know, forget that. But yeah, let's look at this in terms of regimes and repertoires. So, so let's start with governments. Um, there's a bad Google Translate of a definition there. This, this is Tilly's definition. A government is a coercion-wielding organization that enjoys priority over all other organizations and some connected set and over the populations attached to those organizations. Uh, that's a very academic term. Uh, that just means the government comes first, right? It can collect taxes in ways that other people can't collect fees from people. Um, I, I also enjoy the Max Weber definition, which is a little bit old, but uh, the government is that definite, sorry, that institution that enjoys the monopoly on the legitimate use of physical force. Some people translate as violence. Um, meaning that there is only one group in any country that can get away with killing people legitimately, right? And that would be the police and the army, right? If we take a... So let's zoom out from just governments and let's look at the larger idea of a regime, right? So the regime, the government is, is embedded within the regime, but the regime is larger than the government, right? Tilly's idea of democracy is that Democracies typically have a much larger group of actors invested into the regime, whereas autocracies have 
a smaller, more elite group invested into the regime. Um, what is the regime in Hong Kong? It's really interesting, I think. So on, on one hand, obviously, you have groups like the police force. You have people like Si Wai Lung. Um, you also have people like Li Kaixing. Li Kaixing has several vo votes on the election commission. He also has several votes uh, on, on, in LegCo through functional constituencies. And in a lot of ways, it's his government. It's his government more than other people's, right? But Hong Kong is made interesting by also having the Communist Party as part of the regime. And I have there in the photo background of the liaison office, which is in uh, near Shangwa, near Hong Kong University. Um, there in the background, making a lot of decisions, making a lot of policies, and, and they've been saying very clearly that the Hong Kong state, the Hong Kong government, should be working in their interests. Tilly asks us to look at different types of regimes, right? Um, and so he's saying, let's look at it on kind of a scale of zero to one of democracy and a scale of zero to one for capacity. So Tilly, Tilly is making, I think, a good argument here that there's not just, you know, democracy and tyranny, that, you know, things exist on a scale, right? That you have different levels of, he turns into a verb, different levels of democratization, right? And then on the other end, you have capacity, right? Um, how good is the government at actually doing the things they're trying to do? Um, if you just want to think about this, uh, consider many African states have a very difficult time with basic governments. Um, they, they can't build roads, they have rebellions and coups and things like this, and they have a very difficult time suppressing them, right? Or, or, building, you know, or, or building the roads and just getting things done is very difficult. And they can be democratic-ish and they can be authoritarian, right? Um, that, that would be different than this level of capacity. What Tilly is saying is that the tight, the, that the, where regimes fit in these boxes actually tells us about how they respond to contentious politics. Um, just, I'll go over this slide very quickly. Um, Tilly is noting that typically there is an increase in democratization as governments have more capacity until you hit a certain spot where there's too much governmental capacity and it starts becoming more authoritarian, right? Um, that, that you just, you can't have a government that's too powerful and also democratic. Um, so that, that's an interesting point to make. Um, his argument there is that a government with increased capacity is usually a government that has higher growth. And as you have higher growth in a you know, growing economy, you have more stakeholders. That, that want a say in how the government's run. You could also, so here's a way of looking at democratization in different countries. This is using Freedom House scores. Um, so, and this, uh, seven is bad, one is good. Um, and it's worth kind of looking at where Hong Kong fits in with this because it, it's an outlier, right? Usually what we find is that civil liberties and political rights, they correlate pretty strongly, right? Um, then if you, have a, you know, if you have halfway civil rights, you have halfway political rights, right? Um, China, for instance, on, on political rights, it's a seven. There are no political rights, but there are a little bit of civil, civil liberties, so it, it, it's a seven, it's a six, right? Um, if you look at a place like Norway or America, you see it's both one one, right? There's a high degree of civil liberty, there's a high degree of political rights. And what we're talking about political rights is your, your ability to participate in the politics, right? Whereas civil liberties, we're talking about freedom of speech, freedom of press, academic freedom, things like that. Hong Kong is an outlier because we actually have a fairly high degree of civil liberties, right? We, we can talk and complain a lot. Um, what we don't have a lot of is political rights, right? You, you, we can complain all we want, but we don't actually have a say in the government, right? And in some ways, I think that that is the, the, the real contradiction that brought out the umbrella movement, right? That, that we're exposed to all these ideas. We have internet freedom, you know, ideas are moving around, but we can't do anything with those ideas. So returning back to uh, the end of history, right? So Francis Fukuyama, 
said that, you know, if you look at the 20th century, it was a battle of ideas, right? And if you, if you look at how communism is framed, it was that was supposed to be the end of history, right? That the communist regimes were supposed to, uh, you know, basically Marx was arguing that communism was an historical inevitability, right? And I have here a photo of, uh, you know, Vladimir Lenin, um, you know, that, that's what he was saying he was doing. He was bringing Russia to the future, a history that was inevitable, right? Um, that, of course, started ending with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he was like, look, really, you know, here are the, the communists talking about free market economies and competition. Uh, so, you know, something's changed, right? So the end of history meant that free markets are some form of them, democracy, some form of it. And, interest, and interestingly, the end of ideology. Um, Fukuyama writes, both Hegel and Marx believed that the evolution of human societies was not open-ended, but would end when mankind had achieved a form of society that satisfied its deepest and most fundamental longings. Both thinkers thus posited an end of history. For Hegel, this was a liberal state, while for Marx, it was a communist society. Let's also take a look at sources of political power. This is again going from Tilly. Um, he lists three, capital, coercion, commitment, right? Uh, for capital, I'm, I'm showing our typical carrots, right? You can try to entice people to do what you want them to do by providing money, scholarships, jobs, guangxi, all these things to, to, to you know, become part of the regime and system, or follow the regime and the government. Then there's also the stick, just pure coercion, right? You can tear gas people, you can punish them, you can jail them, um, you can, you know, publicly smear them in, in newspapers, as we see in Hong Kong. And then there's just the idea that maybe we don't think about enough, which is commitment, right? And I have here a, a photo of Tiananmen Square, and then there's the photo of, of Mao Zedong, and what it says in Chinese is the Chinese People's Republic will live for 10,000 years, right? What this means is that they're not going anywhere, right? That, that they're going to be there for a long time. And, you know, how they respond to something like the Umbrella Movement is like, hey, you guys can stay out there for 79 days. We've been here for almost 100 years, right? Well, 50 years for, uh, you know, since the revolution, but, you know, the party itself is fairly old in, in China, right? So Tilly is looking at this idea of commitment as a source of power. Now, where he puts this all together is he talks about a political opportunity structure. So from the top down, government policies and relations among established political actors constitute a political opportunity structure that limits the chances for ordinary people to make collective claims, either on the governments or on other actors, right? So he's saying that how, it's very shortly, but he's saying that how people exercise politics in a place like China is going to be very different than how they exercise politics in France because of the basic structures of the regime. Let's spend just a moment talking about forms of resistance, right? Um, I, I have on the left-hand picture, I, I, love, I love pirates, right? Some people just decide to not be a part of the state, right? And they, 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 they prey on the state, and they always stay at the, the edge. They're not an organized oppositional force. They're just kind of predatory. Um, I also have a photo here of the infamous nail houses that you see across China, where the government makes a policy of they want to redevelop land, maybe turn it into a highway, or make you know, new apartments. And you typically, well, it's not that, that common, but you'll have one person who thinks, no, this isn't a good deal. I don't want to do it. And they don't sell their house and they stay there. Um, and then the bottom photo is an interesting historical photo of, I think it was the Nuremberg March, where uh, the Nazis brought everyone out to, you know, seek hell and, you know, uh, you know, Adelaide. Adolf Hitler, and there's the one guy who just doesn't raise his hand, right? He's kind of a hero to a lot of people. Everyone else is following along with this, and he's not having any part of it. I'm also a fan of James Scott. And James Scott talks about infrapolitics, and I think this is something we don't look at enough. So infrapolitics, um, he says, I have in mind such acts as foot dragging, uh, just doing something very slow, poaching, which kind of means like stealing, right? Pilfering. 
dis uh, dissimulation, sabotage, desertion, absenteeism, squatting, and flight. Why risk getting shot for a failed mutiny when a desertion will do just as well, right? Um, he's saying that, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes by him. James Scott is one of my favorite writers, and he has a quote here that you could say it's the peasant's job to stay out of the history books. And that means that people don't usually want to protest. Um, I have a photo below of Mao Zedong meeting peasants, that, that when politics reaches them and when things like that happen, that the things have gone disastrous, disastrous and wrong. And the, generally, that the people who don't have power uh, just kind of want to stay off the radar. I think you could fit umbrella movement in this. Nobody really wanted an umbrella movement. Nobody really wanted this to happen. Uh, and, and that it did happen means that things went disastrously wrong. So let's move into organizing something. So let's say, <clears throat> let's say you want to change things. What's the problem? Who can fix it? Who else is affected? How do you mobilize them around the same concern? Where do you look for examples of what to do with these mobilized people? Now, I'm, I'm having a photo here of Martin Luther King and Osama bin Laden, and some people might take a big objection to that, but I think they're both political entrepreneurs. They're both people that mobilize people into contentious politics, right? Um, and I think that it's also important to note that other people have been borrowing their methods and ideas for a long time. They're both very influential. And also at contentious politics generally. It's a specific type of politics, right? So contention in general includes any individuals or groups making of consequential claims on another individual group. Now consequential means the claim would, if realized, affect their object's interest, right? So political contention matters because it always has implication for a regime's future role and engages the course of power of the governments, right? So contentious politics means that there's high stakes, right? Um, that you're not just calling for a new postage stamp, that you're calling for something that actually influences the, the power in society. Right? So what made the umbrella movement contentious? Well, let's look at what they're asking for, right? Revoking the 831 uh, National People's Congress decision on election rules, right? That, that, that severely in, in impacts the power of the regime. They're also actually asking for C.Y. Lung's resignation, right? That also severely impacts the power of the regime. Um, they wanted apologies for the use of police force, specific, specifically for the tear gassing. Um, this this changes the regime's structure. This changes the regime's structure specifically with regards to the functional constituencies and small election committee. Right. So that's what made this contentious. These were high stakes issues. Right. And the people who had the highest stakes was actually the regime. Right. And this meant that the regime would usually respond with coercion. Right. Just a Quick note on revolution. Tilly defines revolutions as rapid, drastic movements with regard to democracy and or governmental capacity. Um, I make a side argument that I think in some sense there was a revolution in Hong Kong, and that revolution was that the Communist Party had a drastic increase in government capacity in Hong Kong. Um, they were not this powerful before. Um, you could also say that Hong Kong has had a fairly rapid decrease in democracy. Um, as I'm making this, it was announced yesterday that the police want to ban any, quote, fishy groups of three or more people. That's pretty anti-democratic, right? We've seen these major changes. So if there was a revolution in Hong Kong, it probably wasn't an umbrella revolution. It was a red revolution. Um, I'll put this link on YouTube. Um, it's a photo of, sorry, it's a video of a real revolution that happened in Burkina Faso. It's something that starts off in bears some resemblances to the Umbrella Movement. Um, it ended very differently. It ends with them burning down the you know, parliament itself. Um, but do watch that video if you have a chance. Now, let's take an idea. Let's see how people have done contentious politics in the past, right? So we have Gandhi. This is 1915 to 1947. He led a series of strikes and marches, very nonviolent. And eventually led to the collapse of the British Empire, right? Um, he also did things you could call direct action. So, for instance, the British had a salt monopoly in India. Nobody was officially allowed to gather salt. So he would march with thousands of people and they would pick up salt. Um, that's what you see in the bottom right hand. 
Also highly influential was the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, which lasted from 1954 to 1968. And I would stop here for a second to note that these were long movements, right? This one's 15 years. Go back to, to, to Gandhi, uh, what is that, you know, almost 30 years, right? Umbrella Movement was 79 days. These things take time. Um, the Civil Rights Movement was in response to... <sighs> Racism was getting very bad in America. Um, you had something called the Jim Crow laws that were being actively enforced. Um, you had people intimidating um, black voters away from office and away from voting. So you would have you know, towns and cities that had black majority populations, but they couldn't come out to vote. And so you would have white mayors and white representatives that would then make these laws against them. Um, so what they were campaigning for was first uh, to protect their right to vote, and second, for a civil rights amendment, right, making it illegal to discriminate against people in America based on, on color. Um, it culminated with the, the March on Washington. Uh, with state governments, not the federal government, there was a very strong response, right? This is one of the most um, influential pictures. This actually comes from Birmingham, which is where half of my family is from. They, they would you know, spray students with fire hoses, they would sick dogs on them. And what you actually saw happening was that the level of violence levied against these people suddenly, okay, like Americans at this time, white Americans, they didn't like what was happening, but they, they didn't want to rock the boat, right? And this is a little bit similar to, I think, the Hong Kong situation, right? Most people are pro-democracy, but there's big, you know, big disagreements on how you're supposed to go off and fight for it. Um, seeing this violence on TV, led to the passage of the Civil Rights Constitutional Amendment. Um, there's a movie that just came out, Selma, uh, that actually deals with this directly, that, that how the violence, the regime response, led to the changes. Um, we can also take a quick look at the East Bloc, right? Um, Moscow, 1991, you see them dismantling the hammer and sickle. Uh, Lithuania, 1990. Another one was Tiananmen Square. Um, these other two... They worked, right? The Soviet Union did collapse, although it collapsed for other reasons. The, the, the social movements were just kind of the icing on the cake, if you will. So Tiananmen Square started off, and it, it looked a lot like the Umbrella Movement to begin with. It, it, it started out as a commemoration of uh, uh, Hu Yaobao, who was a reformist Communist Party member who uh, had been purged from the party a few years earlier, and he died, and they, were, and they wanted his name rectified. Um, it did not end well, unlike the previous two examples, right? Uh, it, was, it was cracked down with violence. Uh, a recent book that came out on this was, was by Louis Salim. Um, the name of the title is uh, The People's Republic of Indonesia. So not only did it fail, the government has been very successful in eradicating the memory of Tiananmen. Um, I, I would also point out that a lot of the elements of the umbrella movement were taken from Tiananmen. Uh, the first class boycott um, was in response to the Tiananmen crackdown, the first class boycott in Hong Kong. You could also see the EDSA movement in the Philippines, right? Um, people got very tired of martial law. The, the, uh, you could say the straw that broke the camel's back was the assassination of the current president's father, um, Aquino, at the airport. Um, and people hit the streets and uh, the big thing that happened was the military turned on Marcos. Um, so it led to Marcos leaving the Philippines and the end of martial law. And then uh, Aquino's mother, Korea uh, Aquino, becomes the president. She was like the, the people's president. Um, there's been other exit movements since then, but here's another successful social movement. And then there's the Arab Spring. Um, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain. Um, it has been kind of amazing to watch. Um, Egypt, nobody saw it coming. Um, the regime was, was very powerful. Like the Philippines, like the Philippines, um, Egypt had basically been under a state of martial law and the Mubarak regime was, was very violent and ruthless. And um, it, it, it started with, with Twitter and Facebook and people showed up. Um, these things actually tell us a lot about the regimes. There was a lot of violence. Um, it, it, 
though interestingly led to the collapse of the Mubarak regime pretty quickly. Uh, I think it was about a week. And it, it tells us something also about what happened in Hong Kong, which is that legitimacy is usually very important. And what happened was is that Mubarak quickly lost legitimacy. Um, you know, there, there's a, a saying in social sciences, which is that if, you know, 10% of the population stopped actively participating in the government, that uh, the government would just collapse, that, that, you know, governments require cooperation and people working with it. That's kind of what happened here. It's about, you know, a large section of the population stopped working with the government and it collapsed. But what we saw was, you know, we talked about regimes and states earlier, regimes and governments earlier, and the regime basically stayed in power. The government collapsed. The regime stayed in power. And the regime was the military. Um, they had democratic elections after, after Torreira Square, and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood won. And then the military organized a coup, and they are in power today, and they are actually far worse than Mubarak ever was. Libya is just a sad story. Um, again, people didn't see it coming. Um, it is now basically a state of anarchy. Um, Yemen saw an uprising. It's still kind of going on today. Um, Syria is now just a nightmare. It, it started off as very peaceful protest. Um, people thought that would be the end of Assad, but Assad, president of Syria, looked over at Egypt and saw what happened to Mubarak, and he has clung on to power, and it has been... As I said, it's just been a nightmare. Uh, Bahrain has significant Shiite minorities, and they're terrified of Iranian influence, and they crack down pretty hard. So the Arab Spring, actually the only place um, that, that kind of did well afterwards was uh, Tunisia. Let's just take a quick look at like, the effects of what happened, right? So we see governments overthrown in Tunisia and Libya. Um, we saw government <laughs> overthrown multiple times in, in Egypt. Uh, major protest in Sudan. Uh, we saw a protesting government changes in Morocco, um, same thing in Saudi Arabia, uh, major protest in Iraq, and then we, this map is maybe a little bit old because now Libya, the, the big black square beneath India, that should be also civil war. So what Tilly is arguing is that regimes make repertoires, right? And so what we mean by these repertoires, right, is that people are borrowing. These are performances, right? Um, and low-capacity, non-democratic regimes, there are few prescribed performances, meaning that uh, there's not many things people have to do and say. I would say right now this issue over Hong Kong independence is that it's becoming a prescribed performance. Um, you're supposed to say that you think it's a terrible idea, and that the people who say it are stupid, right? And if you don't say that, then you might be in trouble. There's a medium range of tolerated performances, right? Meaning you, you can demonstrate a little bit, um, but there, there, it's, it's a medium range, it's not a broad range. There is much contention via forbidden performances. Now by forbidden performances, it means just things that you're not allowed to do. Uh, occupying is not allowed. Um, and, you know, China, you know, almost any protest is forbidden, right? And you also see low involvement of government agents in contention. Now, this is kind of interesting because it, it, it begs the question of what was the Hong Kong regime? Was it was it low was it low capacity? Was it high capacity? Uh, when you, so when you talk about low involvement of government agents and contention, um, you're saying that they're bringing in other people to do the work for them typically gangs, isn't that what we saw in Mongkok after the first week, right? The triads came in, the police didn't, like the, the police tried, the police failed, and then they sent in the gangs. Um, high levels of violence and contentious and interactions. Um, it's debatable how, how violent Hong Kong was. I think it was very violent by Hong Kong standards. It was not terribly violent by American standards or even European standards. And high capacity, non-democratic regimes, we're talking about places like China now, you have many prescribed performances. There's a lot of things you have to do, right? Like, you can never say Tibet should be independent. You can never say Xinjiang should be independent. Um, that would be East Turkestan, right? Um, the uh, things you, you have to say. Uh, there's a narrow range of tolerated performances, right? There's just not a lot of protest and things like that you can do. There's not a lot of, yeah, you just have a very small array of ways you can, you can critique the government. Almost all contention then is by means of forbidden performances, right? 
So Tiananmen Square, that was a forbidden performance. You're not allowed to come out to Tiananmen and bulk. And when they tell you to leave, you need to leave, right? High involvement in government agents and contentions, um, often as principles, right? So what happened? The troops came in. The government itself came in and dealt with the problem. And you have medium levels of violence and contentions interactions, right? Um, this, this is maybe true in China, right? That because the, the party is strong, um, usually it doesn't end in violence. You can just arrest the people and people are scared and, and they do what you want them to do. So let's look at democratic regimes. Um, few prescribed performances, right? So the governments don't demand that you say things and, and, and believe things. There's an, also a, a medium range of tolerant performances, right? Occupation also was not very acceptable in America. Contention overlapping some of with prescribed and tolerated performances, right? Um, meaning people are mixing up both. You see high involvement of the government as agents in contention, often as third parties. That means that you know, you'll have maybe a bureaucracy uh, trying to mediate the dispute. You typically get low levels of violence and contentious interactions, right? Like the police don't usually crack down violently. And low capacity democratic regimes, um, I, I would maybe put the Philippines in this. There's also few prescribed performances. There's a broad range of tolerated performances, right? Protest doesn't matter. Extensive overlap of contention with both prescribed and tolerated performances. Medium involvement of government agents and contention, right? Like you don't see that many police out in the Philippines when people are protesting. But you do get medium levels of violence and contentious interactions, right? Um, so sometimes things do get out of control. So let's look at social movements in the Hong Kong context, right? There were the Article 23 protests and it worked. Um, about half a million people hit the streets. Um, they were very concerned about the security law and the government eventually backed down. And then you had the anti-national education protest uh, that was in Tamar, about 100,000 people showed up um, and the government again backed down. So Tilly identifies one of the first steps in creating a social movement or well, in any contentious politics is you have to make an identity. Because um, without a recognized identity, it's hard to demand political standing. And without standing, it's hard to voice support for a program, right? Um, so you, you need a we, right? And then once you say we, you know, the we can be elevated, right? And then you're asking for something, right? So in our moment, what we can say it was the, the identity was we, you know, you could say Hong Kong people, you could say it was the students, right? And then once you're established as the students, you have HKFS and scholarism, and then scholarism, if, if they can get government standing, the government says, hey, let's talk. Without that, uh, it's difficult to voice support for a program, right? So there's this constant, um, what, what this also means is governments usually try to deny standing, right? They try to say this is not really a group, right? This is not an or this is not a recognized political actor, this is not part of the regime. Um, what you see in more democratic politics is that this is easier to do and that these people are kind of brought into the regime more quickly. It's like, oh, you are this group, um, you know, you have this agenda, uh, welcome on board, uh, you know, run for seats in Congress and, you know, make, make your claims. So Tilly's most interesting and provocative argument is he's kind of saying there's nothing new under the sun, right? He's saying that we've kind of been doing the same thing since 1967. Um, he says, once we look closely at collective claim making, we can see that particular ins instances improvise on shared scripts, right? So we're looking back and we're seeing Martin Luther King, Gandhi, before that was the, the anti-slavery movement. Um, he's giving examples, presenting a petition, taking a hostage, or mounting a demonstration constitutes a performance linking at least two actors, a claimant and an object of claims, right? Um, this is interesting because he's saying contentious politics isn't always social movements. Sometimes it's things like terrorism, right? Um, but he's trying to say that, you know, taking a hostage, that's a performance. Just like everything we saw in the streets of Admiralty and Hong Kong, it was a performance. Um, he's saying innovation occurs incessantly on a small scale, but effective claims depend on a recognizable relation to their settings, relations between the parties and their previous uses of claim making form. Uh, sorry for the you know the, the, the language there, but he's saying like look, you know, the umbrella movement actually looked a lot like the Article 23 protest, looked a lot like uh, 
the national education protests, which in turn looked a lot like what we saw in Tiananmen. Tiananmen in turn was borrowing from what they saw elsewhere, right? Um, that, that it has to look like something. So people identified, oh, it's like this, right? Um, but he is talking about improvisation, right? Um, and I'm using the picture here of jazz, that, um, you know, you're taking a shared script, but you're bouncing around with it, right? You're, you're, you're doing different things with it, but it's fundamentally the same script. Let's, let's, let's look at contentious claims. First, identity. So identity asserts the presence of a, substan of a substantial collective actor. Sending claims to say, we exist not only exist, but occupy a certain position within the regime. Um, so here, you know, here's, here's a, a sticker I, I took from Occupy, right? So were students actually a single group? Maybe not, right? But this is part of the process. You have to say, students are asking for this, right? Now let's look at this idea of repertoires. Performance is clumped into repertoires of claim-making routines that apply to the same claimant object pairs, right? So uh, you know, the claimant here, the students, the object, 831, CY Lung. Um, Tilly likes to do categorical pairings, right? So bosses and workers, peasants and landlords, rival national factions. Um, he's using, though, the theater metaphor to call attention to the clustered, learned, and improvised character of people's interactions as they make and receive each other's claims, right? What he's saying is this. Are these performances? 9-11, these hostage takings, right? Are, are, are they kind of made for TV? Are they made to be seen, right? Um, that, that's still his claim, and I think there's something to it. And, and we have to ask, um, how much innovation is there, right? Um, so here's a picture again from uh, uh, Martin Luther King's March, I think it's known as Selma, and then we have the Maidan in Ukraine. They all kind of look the same, right? But they're innovating, they're, they're, they are doing different things locally. Okay, so let, let's take a look at the social movement, right? Um, it, it, it's part of a campaign, right? And Tilly will identify a campaign as a sustained, organized public effort at collective claims on target authorities. And almost jokingly, I'm putting here, uh, choose a few of these marches, rallies, processions, demonstrations, occupations, picket lines, blockades, public meetings, delegations, Statements to and in public media, petition drives, letter writing, pamphleteering, lobbying, the creation of specialized associations, coalitions, or, or fronts. Um, I have a photo here of the anti-slavery movement, which is what Tilly identifies as being the first social movements. Tilly argues that social movements have become so ubiquitous, at least in relatively democratic countries, that we simply take them for granted as the natural form of popular claim making. Um, France is a great example of this. There's protest almost every weekend, right? Um, you could say that the Tea Party in America, that that was a social movement. But he says, as we know them, however, social movements had never existed anywhere in the world three centuries ago. Then, during the late 18th century, Western Europeans and North Americans began putting together the elements of a new political form. Um, let me kind of sidetrack here a little bit. One of Tilly's arguments is that the social movement maybe is actually not all that effective in a sense because the, 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 the political forms used before were actually a lot more confrontational, right? Um, like he looks at the history of the strike and the strike began as much more confrontational, right? Someone would come, uh, you know, banging a pan down the streets and getting other workers and they would all leave their jobs from all jobs, you know, like all lines of work, and they'd go out to a field and then the bosses would come out like, all right, how can I get you guys back to work, right? Um, it has evolved over the centuries. Now it's been institutionalized. There's a lot of government regulations around it. Um, you know, unions are a part of politics, especially in places like America and Europe. But this has also kind of defamed them now, right? Like, uh, they don't actually strike. They just go into long, long negotiations about the strike. Um, about, you know, threatening strikes. Um, and now actually labor unions are not very powerful in places like America. Now, Tilly also identifies, I think, one of the most interesting things about social movements is they all have these four attributes. Worthiness, unity, numbers, and commitment. So 
participants concerted public representations of this wonk um, on the part of themselves and or their constituencies. We can call them wonk displays. So a campaign always links the three parties, a group of self-designated claimants, some objects of claims, and a public of some kind, right? Uh, so the, the group here were the students, the people of Hong Kong, um, HKFS, scholarism, even to an extent civic passion, some object of claims, right? See why Long's resignation, uh, you know, overturning 831, uh, getting rid of functional constituencies, and a public of some kind, right? It was a giant display uh, of government versus these parties, uh, versus these groups, trying to influence the public. Um, yeah, don't, don't so much look at the social action of claimants, objects, or public, but the interactions among the three. They, they constitute a social movement. Um, so let, let's, let's take a look. Right? So we have worthiness, sober demeanor, neat clothing, presence of clergy, dignitaries, and mothers with children. Here's a photo I took in the first days of Occupy of somebody had spray painted, dismissed the government, and then somebody jumped up on a railing and started putting white paint over it. And people were cheering and loving it. Uh, you had uh, articles saying that this was the cleanest protest in the world, right? I have other photos of, of kids taking out the trash, right? Um, there, there was an active effort to make the people there look normal, look like just average citizens, and you know, just clean, try to be clean, right? And, and contrast it with you know, the violence of the government, with the, with the, uh, the tear gas. Unity, matching badges, headbands, banners, costumes, marching in ranks, singing and chanting, right? Uh, everyone had the yellow ribbon. You'd see in the first days of Occupy, everyone flips on the lights of their phones, right? We were all together. We were all standing for the same thing. Numbers. Head counts, signatures on petitions, I signed a few petitions, messages from constituents, filling streets, right? Um, no one did a really great head count of Occupy. Um, some people throw out 100,000. Uh, CUHK did a poll that showed 20% of the population participated at some point. That would be more than a million people, almost one and a half million people, right? Uh, Occupy brought out the numbers, so many people. I mean, what at the height of it, uh, it basically stretched from the central MTR all the way to Causeway Bay. And, and Kowloon, it stretched actually from Nathan Road and St. Joshua all the way up to Mong Kok. Commitment. Braving bad weather. Visible participation by the old and handicapped. Resistance to repression. Ostentatious sacrifice. Subscription and our benefaction, right? I mean, the whole term umbrella of movement stood out because the students came out with umbrellas to protect themselves against batons and tear gas, right? Uh, the very first days, there was a massive thunderstorm. I think it was actually even a, a, a was it a black rain? There was bad weather. It was also very hot and humid. They were out there for three seasons, right? They went from summer to fall to winter. So I would, I would beg the question. So here's the linen wall. What's this? Um, I would say this is maybe unity, right? Um, it's also numbers. There's tens of thousands of these post-it notes. What's this? So not a good time. Please don't perform music and fool around during the demonstration. This was actually a problem during Occupy Wall Street. People would bang drums all the time. Uh, I would put this pretty firmly under worthiness. What about this? Free tutoring. English, Chinese, maths, physics, right? Um, I, I think you could put this in the worthiness. I think you could put this under commitment. What about this? I would say unity, uh, maybe worthiness, right? They're young students. What about this? Uh, worthiness, uh, maybe to an extent unity. It's definitely a identity claim making, right? We. Right? We're not enemies, right? So we are worthy. Don't attack us. How about this? Uh, so for those who can't read Chinese, it's saying, like, uh, like stick with it. Uh, add oil, right? Go, go Hong Kong. Uh, commitment. Unity. No violence. We love Hong Kong. I think this is a very clear worthiness display. 
I found this at IED. What's this? I would probably say that this is a, a commitment and worthiness claim. Uh, it's, it's worthiness and that it's contrasting the students with the police, right? The police here, they look like a thug. Um, and, so, and the Chinese here is asking, who are the thugs, right? It's a rhetorical question trying to say it's the police, not us. What about this? Another photo from Hong Kong I had. What I see is uh, commitment. I also see maybe some unity. What about this? I see some commitment here, right? Staying on the same script. Everyone focused on CY Lung. Um, and you also see CY Lung villainized, which in turn makes the people on the street more worthy. What about this? I see commitment, right? This is actually the, the, the hours after the occupation of Civic Square. And what about this? Again, I see commitment. I would then ask, what, what's, what's the problem here? Um, if you can't read the one on the left, it says a less than a day keeps democracy away. Um, on the right, it says pick up your umbrella. Um, I think that it fits with Tilly's critique of social movements are, which is that in a sense, they're, they're a little bit toothless, right? That pick up your umbrella, is that really changing the status quo of the politics in society? Um, is going to class really what keeps democracy away? Um, these are all feel-good things to an extent, but they don't work sometimes, and especially in non-democratic context. So let's, let's look at um, Occupy as a social Right, so C.Y. Lung says umbrella movement was instigated by foreigners. What would Charles Tilly say? Um, the message I'm trying to give is that uh, th this is actually a very common claim that, that autocratic regimes say that these were uh, you know, foreign instigated. Uh, and I think in one part it's just lying. I think in other parts it's a confusion that they're seeing something that was made far away uh, that came from the West. Um, and that, but that doesn't mean it was instigated by the West, right? So the social movement is Western, but you know it's been adapted around the world. Um, are social movements inherently toothless? Um, they can be. Um, they work better in some contexts than others. Uh, the more democratic your polity is, the, the, the more they, they, they can work. But when you do them in non-democratic regimes, um, sometimes not. Would it have worked if Hong Kong was more democratic? Was Hong Kong more democratic before? I think the answer is um, yes. Yes, we've had, uh, as I showed you, we had, we've had two other social movements that were smaller and they worked. I think the fact that umbrella movement didn't work, um, it means that uh, Hong Kong is perhaps less democratic than it was before. And this for me is why Tilly's framework is so useful. Was there any, in, was there any innovation during the umbrella movement or was it all copying? Um, I, th I think there was. Um, I think Gao afterwards that was pretty innovative. Um, I think if you read it, there's a guy named Ian Rowan who has written saying that actually the level of, of self-organization on the streets of Hong Kong was unlike anything he'd ever seen. And that's actually maybe something that other people will learn from Hong Kong. And he actually contrasted it with the Sunflower Movement in Taiwan, also led by students. Um, it was actually very hierarchical, right? That Occupy was leaderless, and this was both a strength and a weakness. Um, I'll leave this just as an open question, you know, what, what's, what's next for Hong Kong politics? Um, what's next for Hong Kong society? Um, things have actually changed since I did this lecture the first time. Um, it, how, how, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, open question, write papers about this if you want.